This isn't madness. It is only the portion of madness recognizable to the sane, expressible in the tongue of the sane, and is ipso facto the sane portion of madness. This is sanitized madness! These words are spoken by an old astronomer with no eyes who's talking to famous mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz when Leibniz was only 19 and didn't even have a measly PhD yet. His doctoral thesis had just been rejected and we meet him on a pilgrimage he travels on alone to go see if this blind astronomer who's predicted an eclipse is crazy or some kind of genius. The book is fiction, by the way. Leibniz never hung out with an astronomer with no eyes waiting for an eclipse, as far as we know. Well then, why him then? Why Leibniz? Why didn't the author of this book we're here to talk about today just have some random guy go interact with the blind astronomer? Why, did, why was it Leibniz? Well, Leibniz has a bit of a reputation for being a kind of rational, logical dude making it all the more interesting to see him in this potentially not so rational situation waiting with a blind astronomer to see if an eclipse that the astronomer predicted is going to happen. I'm thrilled to announce that in this video we have a first for the channel, an actual exclusive interview with the author, Adam Ehrlich Sachs, who was kind and generous enough to respond to some emailed questions about the ideas and themes in his work. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, I just want to say I'm going to do something different in this video in terms of not spoiling the thing I'm talking about. When I did that video about Grease, the film, I mean, I spoiled it, I don't like it, it's also been out for ages, I don't care. I did a video about Portlandia, there's no real narrative to spoil there. Uh, I did a video about that movie about Nietzsche, I think it's a bad movie, no one needs to see it, I didn't mind spoiling it. This is an extremely good book that I really, really want people to read. Um, it's called The Organs of Sense, and I'm gonna make sure not to spoil it. I don't know if it makes it easier or more difficult in this case for me to not spoil that essentially I just have to avoid one specific point, which is whether or not the eclipse occurs. I found out about Adam Ehrlich Sachs because my dad actually gave me a copy of his first book, which is called Inherited Disorders. Uh, I, I took the cover off. I don't know where it is, but it was probably very beautiful. I just, you know, I don't like covers sometimes. Anyways. Inherited Disorders is an extremely good book, and my dad and I don't always have the same uh, book tastes at all. And it's actually about father-son relationships, which probably sounds a little bit lame, maybe, to some people. Uh, but it's actually really absurd and hilarious and extremely enjoyable. It's full of parables, like or short, very short stories, one page, two pages, a few pages at most, often half a page, and with a sort of parable vibe. And... There's like over a hundred of them, and they're just very fun and kind of silly and absurd, but also point at something deep. For example, just to give one example of, so you can understand kind of the background of Adam's writing, there's one story in here that's about an academic who's the son of a deceased philosopher, and he's writing a biography about his late father, and he's quote unquote wearing different hats as he writes this uh, thing about his father. And we can read, we assumed that this was just a figure of speech until a graduate student who happened to be renting an apartment across the street from him reported that he really wore two physical hats. The son of Perelman hat was a Boston Red Sox cap, and the biographer of Perelman hat was a brown fedora. Some evenings he wore the Red Sox cap, some evenings he wore the brown fedora, and some evenings he went back and forth more or less rapidly between the cap and the fedora. Word circulated, and before long, the chair of the department knocked on Perelman's son's office door. The chair urged him to take some time off, please, for his own sake. Bill, said Perelman's son with a knowing smile, is this about the hats? <laughs> And it, and it goes on, but that line, is this about the hats, literally always gets a laugh from me. I've been working on this script for, I think, over a year, and every time I reread that part, it gets a laugh from me. Um, and it really shows Adam's sense of humor being tied to physical objects, which you see a lot in his work. And not just physical objects, but often funny-sounding words, like brown fedora, something about the words, he creates this kind of magic to them. In an interview with Believer Mag about two years ago, Adam said, 
I think that's an important thing to have in a book, funny sounding words, maybe the only important thing. And this was actually in reference to the book we're here to talk about today, The Organs of Sense, uh, and specifically the words, the word glockenspiel. Uh, so glockenspiels, if you're wondering how glockenspiels comes up in this astronomer uh, book thing that we're referencing, it's actually in the story within the story. The story that the astronomer tells to Leibniz as they're sitting there waiting for an eclipse to happen or not happen, glockenspiels come up within that context. Uh, you may have to read the book to find out. Not sure we're going to get into the glockenspiel subplot, but it's so good. So Leibniz listens to the blind astronomer's life story, not just to kill time, but also to gauge whether the blind astronomer is sane or insane. And he tries to get a feel for this through the man talking about his life. Because as Leibniz realizes... Not only doesn't he know if this guy is sane, he doesn't know if he's an astronomer. I mean, he has a big telescope, but he's blind. I mean, how do we know he didn't just wander in to the little observatory on the hill? Listen to the book's description here of the logical situation we find ourselves in. If the solar eclipse took place, Leibniz noted, that was sufficient proof that he was in fact an astronomer, because the probability of someone who is not an astronomer predicting eyes or no eyes, an eclipse that no other astronomer in the world has predicted is negligible. But if the solar eclipse failed to take place, it was no proof that he was not an astronomer, since it is not only non-astronomers who mispredict eclipses, but also astronomers, eyes or no eyes, though of course especially no eyes. If the eclipse does occur, we can deduce that he is actually an astronomer and actually sane, but if the eclipse fails to occur, we can deduce nothing at all. Not that he is not an astronomer, not that he is a fraud, not that he is not sane, nothing. Leibniz suddenly realized the one-sidedness of the sanity assessment. If the man passed the test, he was indeed sane, but if he failed the test, it was no proof that he was not sane. He could fail God's assessment without failing mine, Leibniz wrote. That passage comes four pages in, and that last line, he could fail God's assessment without failing mine, is the shortest sentence so far in the book in terms of words. I, I counted, because I have nothing better to do. So regardless of the fact that I don't have much else that I have to be doing, I did mess this up because actually the quote that comes four pages in is he could pass my assessment without passing God's. And instead in this video, I refer to the line that comes about four pages later, which is the reverse. He could fail God's assessment without failing mine. So whoops. But it doesn't actually change the point I'm making, so anyways, short sentence, came early on, packed a punch. It makes you think, well, wait a second, then which is more important exactly? Let's get a little more detail about this, and I'm, I made a little handy chart to help us out, okay? So, if Leibniz deemed the man's story sane and the solar eclipse furthermore occurred, then the old man was certainly sane, okay? So we have certainly sane in the first box, okay? If Leibniz deemed the man's story insane, yet the eclipse occurred, then too, the old man was certainly sane, okay? So we got certainly sane here. So we got two certainly sanes. That's looking good so far. If Leibniz deemed the man's story insane and the eclipse furthermore failed to occur, then the old man was probably, but only probably, as it would be no demonstration insane. Okay, so probably, but not definitely. Insane. And if Leibniz deemed the man's story sane, but the eclipse failed to occur, then the old man was possibly, but only possibly sane. Although in truth, in that case, at once the thorniest case and the most common, and added Leibniz, actually even the quintessential case here on earth, we would know more or less nothing at all. So, no, basically nothing. And that's good. You know, now we have this chart to kind of help us out. You know, come back to this chart if you ever need to reference it. Um, you, you can tell I did really well in school. You know, I'm really good at uh, assignments. Okay, enough of that. But this brings up some questions, right? Like, if our sanity assessments are one-sided in this way in general, 
then what does that tell us about our sanity assessments, about how we administer them, or about how we interpret them? What should we take away from us failing a human-administered sanity assessment, or failing a God-administered sanity assessment? Well, there are a few things that jump out to me about this. God's test seems to be about actuality, what actually happens, does the eclipse actually occur or not, and The human-administered sanity test, Leibniz listening to the astronomer, seeing if he makes sense, that's more, like, not actuality, because it would be hard to just, you know, put, say that Leibniz is genuinely an arbiter of actuality. It seems like an, uh, maybe appearances-based sort of sanity assessment. But the other thing I noticed about it is that God's test seems to be about predicting the future, being able to predict the future in a way saying, oh, the eclipse is gonna happen based on, you know, my observations and so on. And then the human administered sanity test seems to be about how someone explains the past. So in a way, they seem to be framed in different directions. Maybe that's not totally true, but something that I noticed, but regardless of that, whether you're predicting the future or, you know, recalling the past, that's all based in a similar thing, which is perception. Because you're predicting the future based on past perceptions, or you're explaining the past and your perceptions of it in a way that is coherent to someone's current perceptions, to Leibniz's current perceptions. Can he understand the story that you're telling? Which brings us back to the title of the book, The Organs of Sense and the double meaning of the word sense. Sense as in sanity, like that makes sense, you know? Or sense as in sensation, perception, to, you know, feel. Or whatever, sense in one way or another. Before we go on, let's take a a little, just a little break and relax with an example I thought of that maybe is helpful. When I was working on this script, it was a lot to put all these different ideas together and sometimes I felt like I was wrestling with the script and trying to make it what I wanted it to be. And so I thought about this. If a friend text messaged me and said, hey, what are you up to? And I responded, I'm wrestling. That would be a little odd, right? And then like, it wouldn't be a big deal if I immediately explained what I meant. But if I, for example, got mad that my friend didn't immediately understand what I said and they were like what you're wrestling are are you okay you don't normally wrestle you don't even work out if i got mad that would be unreasonable i don't need to call it insane but it wouldn't be totally sane it would be on the spectrum closer to insane and that's because i would be having unrealistic expectations to an absurd degree about what my friend can understand given what i had given them to perceive. So I just wanted to give a little example there, kind of show how perception can work into like a, you know, a real life, a silly example, but a real life example. Anyways, let's get back to the title, The Organs of Sense. When you read this book, you see that there are two main important ways that sensing or perception comes into play, at least in my read of it. One is sensing as a destroyer of illusions. And two is sensing as a limitation on who we are and how we can be. First, regarding sense as a destroyer of illusions, the astronomer's story to Leibniz kind of starts out with him talking about being a young kid or young adult. And at that time, I guess, a new star appeared in the sky, which I think we later find out was a supernova. But the point is, it was very confusing to the old-fashioned astronomers at the time, who I guess had an idea of like fixed heavens and so on, so a new star kind of ruptured that. And when we hear the astronomer talking to Leibniz about this situation and the joy he got as a young space aficionado messing with these old astronomers with their outdated ideas, he says to Leibniz, you got to use their own eyes to tie them in knots so they can't squirm out of it. So I love that example as, you know, to show sensation as a destroyer of illusions. But let's look at another example of this. According to the novel's narration of Leibniz's writing in an unpublished manuscript, which again, it's fictional, but 
hopefully you remember that. The astronomer tells him how his father was the imperial sculptor of the Holy Roman Empire, this really esteemed position, but then he lost it, like early in the astronomer's childhood, he lost that position when, you know, imperial stuff happened, and he spent, the father spent a lot of time trying to get that position back, it was very important to him. And one way that the young astronomer's father tried to get back into the good graces of the emperor was to kind of create these interesting novelty things to present to the emperor. And the first was a box full of mirrors that was meant to, how do, how do they put it, create an almost infinitely mirrored microcosm of the cosmos, just by looking in this box. And with that, you might already be thinking about the parallel between the father creating this box that created a, a sort of illusion of space and the son actually wanting to empiric empirically explore space through his interest in astronomy, but we're not going to get into that aspect of it right now. The more relevant point is regarding perception as a destroyer of illusions that one day the father looked into the box and kind of realized he'd been lying to himself. We read, he had really believed in that box but from the moment he peered into the box, he could no longer sustain his belief in the box. His faith in that box could not withstand what he now saw in it, which was basically just a lot of mirrors. I love how the word box is repeated there four times in two short sentences, because it sort of begs to be replaced with any other word. Perception can be the destroyer of our illusions and delusions about many things. Uh, when we see, hear, smell, touch, taste, feel, something and we realized that the idea we had about something is an illusion it was off base it was substantially off base have you ever had that experience viewer i'd be really curious uh, i assume it's pretty universal but i'd be curious have you ever had the experience of perception destroying an illusion you had uh you know whether it's in a moment or over a long drawn out period of time let me know perception does more than destroy illusions though <laughs> obviously one other really interesting thing that perception can do is set limits on who we are and what we can think, do, and who we can be. So to explain this, let's talk about the next gift that the father came up with, uh, the father of the astronomer, to present to the emperor. And this is again in the astronomer's story to Leibniz. It was to create a realistic automaton of a human head. And this is something the astronomer's father got help from the astronomer with. Again, when the astronomer was like an adolescent, they're working on it together. And they finally finish and they go to bring it to the palace to present to the emperor. And in a way that really exhibits the enjoyably surreal nature of this book, uh, as they're approaching the palace, the astronomer's father, he actually starts getting younger and his hair turns from white to gray and, and to, I think, black eventually. So let's look at a little passage explaining this situation. The astronomer realized that he did not and could not comprehend the appeal to his father of proximity to power until that moment, as he watched it affect the coloration of his father's beard. We were very different creatures, I realized. If I could not even sense this life force emanating from the center of the empire, whereas he not only sensed it, but somehow tapped into it to affect the rejuvenation of his beard. It was not merely a matter of different tastes, of valuing things differently, but of different sensory apparatuses, of sensing things differently. Seeing his beard get grayer, first a little grayer and then a lot grayer, I naturally felt a surge of sympathy for my father, whom I ought to have regarded not as a man with different principles, but as an animal with different senses less a shameless courtier than a bat. Now the end of that quote may not seem very flattering to the astronomer's father because bats don't always have the best reputation, but the point isn't to put down the father or lift him up or anything like that, but to just point out they're different creatures and that even though the father's urges may have seemed superficial in certain ways to the young astronomer, they were experienced as vital and necessary by the father. Another example of the way this book talks about how perception can set limits on who we are is in another part of the story the astronomer tells to Leibniz about later in the astronomer's life when he actually attains his own imperial position as a private tutor to the children of the emperor. 
So at one point, he's tutoring the prince, young Prince Heinrich, and we hear about him telling about this to Leibniz, and we essentially get a story within a story within a story, and we're hearing Heinrich talk to the astronomer during those tutoring sessions, specifically talking about when he needed to have bloodletting done, the prince, I guess, having people take out you know parts of his blood, or not parts of his blood, certain quantities of his blood, because that would help him sleep, or you know stuff like that. And when he's describing it, he talks about sort of developing a romantic crush on the daughter of the bloodletter who would come every day and and take his blood and he explains that the prince explains that while he couldn't even stand the sight of his blood because he was so squeamish the bloodletter's daughter had no problem and could look right into the bowl as it filled up with the young prince's blood we read in heinrich's words it wasn't that she thought of blood differently. If she had merely thought of blood differently, she would have been squeamish too, and have had to pit, as I did, her squeamishness against her thoughts, against her will, in the hope that her thoughts and will would overcome her squeamishness, instead of her squeamishness, her thoughts and will. But there was in Ludmila's head no such battle of thoughts and will versus squeamishness. There was simply no squeamishness for her thoughts and will to overcome. When she looked at blood, she saw something different. So her perception was fundamentally shaped by, we could say her past experience, by her being a different person. She perceived an object, an experience, a, a, a real thing common to them both differently, fundamentally differently, to such an extent that she wouldn't faint or have any significant physical reaction. Taken together, these examples of the young astronomer and his father being constituted differently and of Heinrich and Ludmila being constituted differently, I don't know about you, but I really related to those. As someone who thinks a lot about my relationships, maybe overthinks about them sometimes, and as a therapist who spends a lot of time, probably more than average, thinking about people's relationships and how we are and how we get along with each other, I very often come back to this question of what if we're just by nature different? What, what, how do we know what, how we're constituted? How do we know exactly what we can expect in terms of behavior from someone else given that they could be constituted differently? We could be family. We could be close friends. We could have a ton in common and they could still be just fundamentally different in some way that doesn't mean we can't be friends or family but in a way that could cause issues. And when I'm trying to resolve those issues in my life or help a client resolve those issues in their life, it's really important to know what is possible to, ex you know, what is reasonable to expect is kind of based on what is possible to occur. And what is possible to occur is kind of based on how people are constituted and who they are. And I'm not saying give up and stuff like that. And at the same time, you need to know what is reasonable to expect to change? Where are the boundaries on what is changeable? For example, I might realize that a friend or family member is not always a very good listener, maybe talks over me, maybe, you know, cuts in, maybe like just has so much to say, I don't really get a word out all the time or something like that. And realizing that maybe that's like extremely hard for them to control and is sort of a part of like how they in interface with the world, it's not a very comforting thought necessarily, but it is helpful. It's genuinely helpful, so I don't have unrealistic expectations. It doesn't mean give up, but it's something to be aware of just in, in my experience with other people. You know, like, is it even an interruption if they don't see it as an interruption because they grew up in a family where everybody was constantly interrupting people and that's just normal? It Like, what even is an interruption? It's an abstract concept. Who am I to objectively say that they're a bad listener that I'm being interrupted. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying take this all 100% to heart, but it's something that's always worth thinking about. What can I really expect from this particular person? How much do I have to adapt? How much do they have to adapt? These are hard questions. And as we looked at in a previous video, our expectations can actually shape our perceptions in a way similar to how our perceptions obviously shape our expectations in the future, you know, based on what we've experienced and perceived. One final point about the double meaning of sense as perception as well as sanity is in the way that when the astronomer's talking to Leibniz, 
he mostly comes off pretty sane as far as I'm concerned. There are a few points where he's a bit neurotic and off when he's maybe talking about his rivalries with Kepler and other astronomers, but he comes off the most sane, specifically at the points where he's aware of Leibniz's... Leibniz's? Leibniz's perceptions of him, of the astronomer. At one point, the astronomer says to Leibniz, this probably sounds obscure when he's explaining something, and basically, he just comes off as the most sane when he's uh, anticipating the perceptions of Leibniz, or as we might put it, getting out of his own head. Which brings us to solipsism. If you don't know what solipsism is, don't worry, you actually do, because I do. That's a solipsism joke. Solipsism is the sort of philosophical idea that you can't really prove that other people exist. You can't prove for sure that other people have their own internal lives and experiences. You only know for sure that you do. And the organs of sense has a lot of different themes related to solipsism that come up in many iterations. Uh, maybe the first one is when Leibniz is thinking about the difficulty of doing this sanity test and understanding what's true or false about what the astronomer is saying. So we can read, The problem of entering a human head, a problem that hitherto had not even struck him as a problem at all, and which afterward would never strike him as a problem again, because before that day, and again after that day, but not on that day, Leibniz had absolute faith in the power of rational discourse to lay bare for us the contents of a human head, now struck him only a few minutes into his exchange with the astronomer as potentially insoluble, horrifically so. As the astronomer's head talked, Leibniz half listened to it talk and half tried to figure out how to get inside it. And soon after this, we read that Leibniz wrote in his notes, Never had I been so reliant on words to expose to me the innards of another head, and never had words seemed so unequal to the task. During the time he's thinking this, the astronomer is going on about how his astronomy rivals like Kepler ate too many dumplings in for dinner and stuff, and so they would end up having to go to sleep early and not get the best astronomical observations, and he's just going on and on about the, these dumplings. And first of all, we're reading this and cracking up because it's really hilarious. But second of all, we're, we're thinking like, okay, yeah, maybe something does sound a little bit off about this astronomer and how he's explaining things. Not that he sounds insane, but this hang up about dumplings, it, it just kind of makes you wonder, well, can I really trust what he's saying about like inventing the telescope and stuff like that? I mean, how do I know what is true of what he's saying? And this is part of why the human administered sanity test is easier to pass because Leibniz doesn't have access to that information, really. He can only try to guess. Solipsism is not just a sort of philosophical argument that philosophers have in academia and stuff. It's also, to a certain extent, an actual experience that people sometimes go through, and often very temporarily, as we see in this book with Leibniz, who only is having this solipsistic experience on that day, never before or after. But believe it or not, the author, Adam Ehrlich Sachs, actually has had experiences like this himself. And this was often in times of significant stress or other difficulties. And so when I interviewed him, I asked him about this and, and I asked him what it was like to write about it and how do people get out of this solipsistic state. And here's what Adam said. He said, the frightening thing about those states of mind was that it was clear to me while I was in them that there was no way to think my way out of them. A solipsistic view of the world is perfectly coherent and self-consistent, even if it's perfectly insane. It can't be touched by any sort of counter-argument. Even Wittgenstein's private language argument, insofar as I understand it, which is probably not at all, bounces right off it especially if you happen to be in it. I hate that solipsism is so often used as a pejorative, like it's just an extreme case of selfishness which a person could choose to snap out of if they were just a little more empathetic or something. That has nothing to do with solipsism. Anyway, it's definitely better not to be in that state of mind, but I'm not sure how I got out of it. I think maybe just the outside stress went away, I took the test or whatever, and probably started socializing again, and it just gradually lost its grip on me. 
This is the Hume subduing his philosophical terrors by going to play backgammon with his friends technique, and it's the only one I know of. As for writing about it, well, for one thing it's fraudulent at every moment, since it's hard to imagine anyone who is truly solipsistic bothering to write down a word. What would be the point? You're always at some distance from whatever mood you're trying to write about, but if you're writing about solipsism, you're sealed off from it completely. Probably the most you can do is describe what it looks like from the outside, and that lends itself to comedy, because from the perspective of another person, it is clear, by definition, that the thing the first person is so fervently convinced of simply is not true. A person in a solipsistic condition, while very sad, is also very funny, though possibly not to a therapist? <laughs> oh, that cracked me up so much. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I can laugh about it when they can laugh about it, and, you know, humor is one of, if not the most, mature and helpful defense mechanisms in the right situations and contexts and ways. So I encourage people to laugh at their own delusions and illusions or to laugh at other people's if it's helpful. I don't have a rule of thumb to know every time when it's helpful. You have to use your judgment there. But yeah, being able to laugh through that stuff, absolutely. But the point I also really like, I mean, he made so many good and interesting points there, but I, I love the idea that it's not so easy to just think your way out of these experiences. And actually, there's a material basis for the mind state that you're going through. So going to, you know, Hume going to play backgammon with his friends, you need to actually change and shift the material basis, the experiential basis of the mind state that you're having. You can't just sort of choose or will it away. You know, our thoughts come from physical and, and uh, real experiences in the world and they're not gonna sort of go away necessarily if we don't put things into a better place in our actual day-to-day -day experience. For example, during this pandemic, there have been significant stretches where I'm alone too much and it kind of sucks. And I can't just choose to feel less lonely. I need to actually interact with other people. That's something that there's a material basis for the mind state I'm having and you need to shift the material basis if you wanna shift the mind state. Not always, but often and usually I would say. Mind over matter can be a big lie sometimes, in summary. You know, you spend enough time alone, as the Prince Heinrich or the astronomer did, and it's easy to become solipsistic. But spend time around other people, especially enjoyable time around other people, and it's pretty hard to argue against their existence, I would say. The most pronounced example in the book of solipsism is Prince Heinrich, and as I said, we meet him when the astronomer was tutoring him in his story to Leibniz, and this is because the prince had actually temporarily gone insane, I guess you could say, and murdered someone in a solipsistic state. It, the murder was 100% rooted in solipsism. He was trying to prove whether they were real or not, kind of dark, but it's, you know, it's an example of how that could be taken to an extreme. We read how Heinrich thought, as he told the astronomer, can we tell an organism from a mechanism objectively outside our head when that mechanism might be very fine, very delicate, as precise as you like, and engineered by a craftsman of genius? Now, if that passage makes you think back to the young astronomer's father creating an automaton of a human head, that's not a coincidence. But what's also not a coincidence is how similar the solipsism of Heinrich is to the solipsism of Leibniz, as he said, as we talked about earlier, how can I get in this head? How can I get inside this head? As he's listening to the astronomer talk. And their solipsisms are both very similar to the solipsism of the astronomer, who says at multiple points that he agrees with points that the prince made. For example, the astronomer tells Leibniz that the prince told him that everything is the same. There's just this sameness to everything. And the astronomer says that the prince was right. And the astronomer says such solipsistic things to Leibniz as, so I came to realize that I really would take the world with me when I died. The fixed stars and the erratic ones and the earth and the sun and everything else. Just as I had once thought, I would, not you and not anyone else either. In my interview with Adam, I asked him if these experiences of solipsism of the various characters were similar, different, or on a spectrum in some way. And Adam replied, I'm not sure if I was intentionally arranging these characters along a spectrum of solipsistic tendencies, but that makes sense to me in retrospect. Because I remember the worst fear of the solipsistic state of mind being, what if I never snap out of this? If not for that, it might have been an interesting experience. 
I don't do hallucinogens, but I can imagine it's the same thing there. If you know it'll wear off, you can enjoy the weird feeling. But if you think it might last forever, there's probably nothing more terrifying. And probably the last person you want to meet if you're wondering when your bad trip will end is someone whose bad trip has lasted for 50 years. This would most certainly be scary for the temporarily solipsistic person to be interacting with someone who's been solipsistic for decades, but I'm not sure that it would necessarily negatively impact the actual course of the the more briefly solipsistic person's solipsism, if that makes sense. It might be very scary, but as we see in this book, if we can use that as an example, Leibniz was never solipsistic again after that day. But there's a lot of reasons why people can experience solipsism differently. And when I asked Adam about these differences, he said, I'm not sure why, but yeah, probably a natural disposition. So the going off to play backgammon method might only work for those who are already disposed to snap out of it at some point. Like Hume, when not stricken by doubts, seemed to have been a pretty cheerful, sociable person. Which brings us back to natural dispositions, which we talked about when we were talking about sensation or perception, and when we talked about the young astronomer learning to see his father not as a man with different principles, but as an animal with different senses. I really appreciate how this book talks about natural dispositions and the way we're constituted. You often see people make appeals to nature in really fallacious ways, really often, but I don't think this is one of those ways because there's no like specific way, oh, all people are like this by nature. It's just a claim that we are fundamentally different. We're all unique creatures and it's something we wanna keep in mind. In my life, I struggle with this a lot. I mean, just because someone's natural disposition might be what it is, it doesn't make it okay or justified. And it's hard to even know when it's someone's natural disposition. But having this idea that Leibniz doesn't suffer as much with solipsism just because he's built different, it may not be comforting because it takes a sort of sense of power away, but it also feels true which is always empowering in itself to know or think the truth because it helps you adapt to reality. One thing I found really interesting was Adam's response to a kind of silly question I asked him. I asked him who he thought was the most sane or reasonable character in the book. And Adam replied, they're probably not deep enough for that. I want a book as a whole to be as deep as a human head, but its constituent parts, like the constituent parts of the human head, are not heads themselves, just tissue and gunk. And this connects to the last point I wanted to make in this video. Because while to us these characters are just tissue and gunk, I would argue that to each other, they're not. They're deep. They're not just tissue and gunk from the perspective of another character in the book. This is why we see the astronomer in one of my favorite passages in the book express sort of regret about how his analytical framework of thinking had deconstructed some of the mystery and depth and beauty of the other people in his life. We read, The tale I am now telling you, minus of course the last and most crucial part, wherein I lost my eyes, began in those days to arrange itself in my head as I peered at my life through my longer and longer introspective mechanism and broke myself and my family members into smaller and smaller rearrangeable bits and pieces, said the astronomer. This was not entirely a good thing, he felt, and in fact, as he resolved the nebulous portions of his life into discrete and indistinguishable bits and pieces, just as he resolved the nebulous portions of the skies into discrete and indistinguishable stars, he felt it was entirely a bad thing. With his longer and longer and more and more powerful inner technology, he resolved his mother into smaller and smaller and hence less and less nebulous and interesting bits, chopped her basically into hundreds of tiny bits and pieces, and then did likewise to his father, then to his son. We didn't talk about the son, you gotta read the book for that stuff, it's really good. And then to himself until they were all chopped into extremely small, entirely unmysterious, and completely uninteresting bits. Bits of disposition, personality pieces, bits and pieces of belief and inclination and habit, and to the sky he did the same thing, or something similar. Being a human is complicated. Achieving what you want in your life while having the mind state you want is not simple and may not always be the case. We're deeply shaped by our environment as we bumble through eternity and try to figure out who the thing is that's bumbling. I studied philosophy in my undergrad program. I'm a therapist. I believe in the power of analysis. Let me tell you, 
I genuinely do. I think it helps us enormously in our life and with mental health in particular to analyze ourselves and our surroundings and other people. And yet, I could not agree more with this point, which I've never seen expressed this well anywhere, which is that analysis has downsides and it, it can detract from the beauty of life. To understand the world better can, can add to the beauty of life, but analysis doesn't always mean you're understanding the world better. Sometimes it just means you're understanding the world differently. And that's, you know, sort of for you to be able to determine. Maybe if we want to stay sane, we have to embrace the unknown sometimes and not always try to be arranging the tissue and gunk of reality into comprehensible subjects that we can analyze. And trust me, I find this harder than anyone because my brain and my analytical part of my brain really thinks it's hot shit sometimes. There is an enormous amount of energy and emotion in this book, and by no means is it like just a philosophical treatise or a dry, boring sort of philosophical text. I could not communicate the, the passion and the energy and the pitch of some of these scenes, even if I tried, which I wouldn't wanna try, because that's why the book exists. I hope I did a good job of presenting some of these ideas in this book and giving my two cents about them. And I hope that other people connect with these ideas and maybe can share some interesting experiences uh, of your own in the comments. I really think there is so much to be said about a work like this, but you know, I gotta, gotta draw the line somewhere. So we're gonna stop here. I really hope I inspired you to go get this book, The Organs of Sense by Adam Ehrlich Sachs. Maybe I'll put a link to, to his website or to, I don't know, some good place to buy the book or something if, if you're too lazy to type it into a browser or something like that. And I just wanna say thank you very much for watching this far. I'm, I'm so glad you did and I put a lot of work into this obviously and uh, really enjoy enjoy talking and thinking about these these ideas. I am extremely grateful to the author, Adam Ehrlich Sachs. Thank you so much, Adam, for responding to questions, for being so kind over email. Like really, absolutely, this is one of the sort of highlights of my artistic life to be able to do this project and even have an interview with Adam. If you people watching this would like to know more of the interesting things Adam said in my email interview with him, uh, for example, I asked his feelings and thoughts about Kafka's letter to his father, given Adam's, uh, you know, ins being inspired by Kafka, I think he's mentioned a few times in his work, and given Kafka's letter to his father being this like, like very, very long screed Kafka wrote about a subject Adam, you know, has written an enormous amount about father-son relationships. So Adam's got some really interesting thoughts about Kafka's letter to his father, uh, which you can see the full interview on this channel's Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash what's therapy. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, we also have a ton of other videos, mu music even, like I'll put the background music of this video in a shortened version, you know, high quality up there as well. And so feel free to come by if you want to support the videos, pay a few bucks. It can be nice to do. You don't have to, it's totally fine. And, and I like you just watching these videos. You can also send them to friends, family, enemies, uh, you know, do, do whatever feels right, but that always feels awesome to me. So feel free to do that. And I want to thank my patrons, the three people currently who support these videos. Uh, thank you so much. That means a lot. So we have put my name in the credits, winky face, um, Elise, and another cool anonymous person. These must be very cool people. I'm just saying. So thank you to you all for supporting these videos. I hope you like this one. I don't, I don't really know which videos people want to see more and not, but you can let me know. Oh, and yeah, about whether the eclipse happened. It